Restriction enzymes are some of the most powerful tools in a molecular biologist's toolbox. They work like scissors in that they function to cut DNA at very specific sequences. They were first discovered in 1970, and there are over 3,000 that exist, about 600 of which are available commercially. Before we can talk about how they function to cut DNA, let's talk quickly about the general structure of DNA. A single strand of DNA is made up of a series of individual nucleotides that are held together by phosphodiester bonds, which form via dehydration synthesis or condensation reactions. We will go into more detail about the structure of DNA later, but for now, all you need to know is that the phosphodiester bonds hold the nucleotides together in a single strand. Hopefully you remember that DNA is a double-stranded molecule. Hydrogen bonds hold the nitrogenous bases of two different strands together. Therefore, both the phosphodiester bonds and the hydrogen bonds in a piece of double-stranded DNA need to be broken. Restriction enzymes evolved in bacterial cells as a way to fight off foreign invaders. You should remember from micro some of the basics about the way in which a virus functions. The bacteriophage, or virus, attaches to a host cell and injects its DNA into the host. The viral DNA then takes over the host cell, assembling its own proteins, eventually forming hundreds of new viruses, and eventually causing the host to lyse, which releases all the viral particles so that they can infect other cells. Restriction enzymes are produced by bacterial cells to chop up the viral DNA so that it can't code for viral proteins that eventually kill the host. In this way, restriction enzymes restrict the viral DNA from infecting the host. If restriction enzymes function to chop up DNA, why are they not destructive to the host's own DNA? Some can change the shape of the host's DNA by adding methyl groups, known as methylation, so that the restriction enzymes won't be able to recognize it. Restriction enzymes can be classified in a number of different ways. They can be exonucleases, meaning they chew up DNA from the ends inward, or they can be endonucleases, which cleave the DNA in the middle. Endonucleases are much more discriminatory than exonucleases, in that they only cut the DNA at specified sequences. For example, the restriction enzyme called ECHOR1 cuts only at the sequence GAATTC. They can be blunt-ended cutters, meaning that they leave flat or blunt ends, or they can be sticky-ended cutters, meaning that they leave ends with single-stranded overhangs. It is really the endonucleases that leave sticky ends that are of the most interest to us in this course. The main purpose of restriction enzymes is to create recombinant DNA, or DNA that has been combined from more than one source. This diagram shows the way in which recombinant DNA is created. Two different DNA molecules, A and B, are cut with the same restriction enzyme, in this case known as BAMH1. BAMH1 always recognizes the sequence GGATCC and cuts as shown by the green lines in the diagram. For the simplicity of this diagram, only one sticky end of each strand is shown. The black X's covering the sticky ends that are not shown in this next step of the diagram. Notice that the nucleotides on the remaining sticky ends conveniently pair with one another so that, when in proximity to each other, they will hydrogen bond. When the enzyme DNA ligase is added, the phosphodiester bonds making up the backbone form as well. Each restriction enzyme has a unique name based on the bacteria in which it was discovered. ECHOR1, which, would, which was mentioned earlier, is one of the many restriction enzymes that exists. It is named as follows. The first letter, E, comes from the genus Escherichia. The second two letters, CO, come from the species coli. The R comes from the strain RY13, and the 1 comes from the fact that this restriction enzyme was the first one isolated from this particular strain of E. coli. As you can see here, ECHO R1 cuts at the sequence GAATTC in the way that is shown in the diagram. 
The naming of two other common restriction enzymes, BAMH1 and HIN-D3, is shown here, as well as the sequences at which these restriction enzymes cut. Restriction enzymes can be placed into one of three classes, the first of which is type 1. Type 1 restriction enzymes can both cut and methylate DNA. ATP is required in order for these enzymes to work, and they cut at random sites that are far away from the recognition sequences. As a result, they are not that useful for our purposes because they do not generate sticky ends with known nucleotide sequences. Type 2 restriction enzymes only cut DNA. They do not methylate it. ATP is not needed for them to function, but magnesium is a cofactor and must be present in order for these enzymes to work. When used in the lab, we add buffer containing magnesium ions to the enzyme so that they will function. These are the class of restriction enzymes that are the most useful to us because they cut at specific sites on the DNA that are within the recognition sequences. Type 3 restriction enzymes both cut and methylate DNA. They require ATP and they cut at sites that are specific but not within the recognition sequences. As was mentioned a minute ago, type 2 restriction enzymes are the most useful to us as scientists. Most of them recognize a 4 or 6 nucleotide sequence, which is palindromic, meaning it is the same sequence from the 5' prime end to the 3' prime end on both strands of DNA. You can see here that both of these are palindromic sequences. If you look at the piece of DNA on the left, read the sequence of the top strand from the 5' prime to 3' prime end, G-A-A-T-T-C. If you read the bottom strand sequence, 5' prime to 3', prime, it is also G-A-A-T-T-C. Notice that the restriction enzyme creates sticky ends. The picture on the right shows a blunt-ended cutter that also recognizes a palindromic sequence. From 5' prime to 3', prime, the sequence is G-A-T-A-T-C. How many times do restriction enzymes cut a particular piece of DNA? The answer to this question depends on the size of the DNA that is being cut as well as the size of the recognition sequence. Let's say you had a, re a restriction enzyme that cut at the sequence G, 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 G. What is the chance that you would find this sequence in the DNA? There is a 1 in 4 chance that you would find the first G, a 1 in 4 chance that you would find the second G, a 1 in 4 chance that you would find the third G, and a 1 in 4 chance that you would find the fourth G. Therefore, a 4 base recognition sequence will be found roughly once in every 256 bases. If you think about the fact that the E. coli genome is roughly 3 million base pairs, you'd expect that a restriction enzyme recognizing a 4 base sequence would cut the E. coli chromosome about 12,000 times. Let's apply the same logic to a restriction enzyme that recognizes a 6 base sequence. The probability of finding a 6 base sequence is about 1 in 4096. Therefore, you'd expect a restriction enzyme that recognizes a 6 base sequence to cut the E. coli genome about 730 times. Restriction enzymes have a wide variety of uses in the lab, many of which we'll see in the coming weeks. Perhaps most commonly, they are used to insert a gene of interest into a plasmid vector, as is shown in the top diagram on the right. If you cut a plasmid, a small circular piece of DNA, and a gene of interest with the same restriction enzyme, such as ECOR1, for example, the sticky ends of both will align so that the gene of interest can be inserted into the plasmid. This is how the GFP gene was inserted into an existing plasmid to create PGLO. This newly formed recombinant plasmid can then be used to transform cells. The large-scale production of insulin occurs in this way, as the gene for insulin production was inserted into a plasmid, which was then used to transform E. coli so that the bacteria would crank out large amounts of the hormone for use by diabetics. Restriction enzymes are also used to distinguish between different alleles or forms of the same gene. If one allele of a particular gene has a restriction site, 
and another allele does not, doing a restriction digest of the particular gene and then running a gel with the results will allow you to determine which allele is present. We will better understand this application in a few weeks when we do a lab on distinguishing between different alleles of the same gene using restriction enzymes. You can also do a restriction mapping experiment to figure out where various restriction enzymes cut a particular plasmid. We will do a lab on this concept later on in the term as well.